Now that ticking of the clock, it's very, very soft sound. We specially recorded it. It's the ticking of a very, very handsome and a very beautiful clock in a very small room, but a room of great history and a shrine of many people throughout the world. For we are, in fact, just off the city road without the city walls, north of London Wall, and the home at one time of John Wesley. And John Wesley, who lived in this house where I am at the present moment, and alongside the house is Wesley's chapel, might we describe it as the Academy Cathedral of the Methodist Church. And I'm lucky to have here today the minister of Wesley Chapel, who is, in fact, Mr. Alan Bertwistle. Now, he is really a successor to John Wesley himself in the chain since John Wesley's life two centuries ago. Now, the room we're in at the present moment is a simple, very small room. Its furniture consists of a bureau, beautiful walnut bureau, a bookcase. There are three or four chairs in it, that's all. A small desk and then a fireplace. Above the fireplace, a tremendous portrait of John Wesley himself. And then one curious trophy here, John Wesley's umbrella. And his very little notice attached to it, it says, please don't open the umbrella. And then in the corner, a glass case showing the robe and the shoes and the buckles and the hat of John Wesley himself. Now the room itself, I said, is perfectly plain. The walls are a pale gray, beautiful ceiling with a lovely cornice. And then round the whole room, panelling, simple pine wood panels, and again the fireplace, again perfectly simple, and a really an attractive room, and the floor itself, no carpet, perfectly plain floor. Now, Mr. Bertwistle, first of all, before we talk about this house and the trophies you have in the room, which are, you'll tell us something about presently, about the man himself, John Wesley. He was, of course, a member of a very large family indeed, and he and his brother were the great preachers of the day, and he was formed the Methodist Church. Is that, is that what you, how you describe it? Yes, that's fair enough. He was the, uh, one of the last uh, to be born of a family of 18. Charles, his brother, the great hymn writer, some of our most well-known hymns, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, and Love Divine, or Love's Excelling, um, were written by Charles, was um, a little younger than John. John was always a serious child. The first recorded speech that we have of John was when he was uh, about three years old. Someone asked if he would have a second helping of pudding, and he said, I thank you, I'll think on it. And his father later on said, um, in Latin, um, our Jackie will never do anything unless he's got a perfectly worked out logical reason for doing it, not even going to the loo. <laughs> John was a most methodical man, and that was really why the Methodists got their nickname from the way in which the Holy Club, John and Charles and a few more students at Oxford University, met together to take the New Testament seriously. They um, used to visit the poor and those in prison and the sick and spend their time in prayers and in Bible study. And their day was very severely worked out and methodical. Now, what sort of age was he when he was recognized as being the leader of the nonconformists? Yes, he was born in 1703, and the great event of his life, um, and you could call it a conversion, at Aldersgate Street, after he had for some time been um, on an ordained um, clergyman of the Church of England and had been a missionary in Georgia in America, that heartwarming experience took place in May of 1738, and from that moment, he moved into the leadership of the movement that he created. In his middle thirties? That's right. And then after that, when did he start um, the building of his chapel and so on? Was this much later? Because he had a place, I think I'm right to say, the yeah. foundry, wasn't it? Wasn't That's just... quite right. Within a year, he had bought um, a, a ruined foundry outside the ancient city walls of London on Moorfields, 
near to Moorgate Station, and um, he had that refurbished so that he could hold uh, a preaching service, as he did, at five o'clock each morning, and the place was crowded. A thousand um, and five hundred people could be held uh, in that room. The um, foundry also had a smaller room for smaller meetings, a school for 30 poor boys and 30 poor girls, where they could be educated free of charge, rooms where elderly widows could retire, and the first free medical clinic in the London area since the dissolution of the monasteries. That was the first headquarters of the Methodist movement. And from 1739, when he first took it over, for 40 years, he used it as a great center of social service as well as of evangelical preaching. It was when that um, foundry became, uh, again, rather derelict and the lease was falling in, that in 1776 he began to collect money for the building of what we now call Wesley's Chapel in the city road. And this house was also built by him, was this his this house? This house was built at the same time as the chapel, and here he lived for the last 12 years of his life. Yes. And he was a great orator. He had a very remarkable gift. He hadn't the immense liquid oratory of George Whitfield, but he had a gift which any public orator would envy and which people immediately recognized. This cool, calm, logical little man seemed to be speaking to you, to me, directly. Everyone um, who heard him said the same thing. It was as though he was speaking just to them. An obvious sincerity. Tremendous sincerity and an enormous faith. The sincerity and the faith are focused uh, on the little room uh, near to us uh, on the same floor of this house. Well, just before we move into the other room, why don't we just have one or two things? I was going to ask about this chair. I know there's a story attached to it, and I want to hear it from you. But could I just say that the chair itself, it's uh, got a notice on it which says the actual study chair of John Wesley, circa 1720-1790. Now, it's a low chair. It has uh, a back to it, no arms to it at all, now as you'd rest your elbows on it. It's a sort of, almost a wing chair in its way. The seat is quite small, black leathered, a very narrow back, and then up to these two almost encircling short arms which go out unsupported on either side. It's a curious chair. Some people call it a saddle chair, I think it's, I've heard it called, isn't it? The story is, first of all, that he found it more comfortable later in life, having sat in the saddle to travel all over England for so many years, and um, found it more comfortable to sit on this chair, as you might say, the wrong way round. That's with his arms leaning on the back. Mm. And there is a board in front of him on which he used to place his book or the paper on which he was writing. We understand that the chair originally belonged to the man who took the bets at a cockfighting pit, and I can only hope that the man was converted and handed the chair to John Wesley. But certainly Wesley found it more comfortable to sit that way round than uh, yes. the ordinary way of a chair. Yes. And as we leave this room to go to one of the other rooms, we pass just by this mirror-fronted bureau, beautiful walnut bureau. There are one, two, three, four, five, six. It looks like six little drawers. In fact, it's only two drawers of three each because they are concave in shape, walnut, inlaid, and then on either side of the table, which is quite common in bureaus today, you've got your two side drawers, also concave, one on the right-hand side and one on the left-hand side. But we're going to concentrate on the one on the left-hand side because uh, Mr. Bertwistle has, has a little, I think, knowledge of it that only probably John Leslie had at one time. This, as a matter of fact, is the place where he used to keep um, a little store of money because this was a tough area in those days, even as it is now. It was a, a long time before I really discovered the secret of it, but when you've pulled the drawer out, there is um, a length of um, wood attached to it, a kind of box which is behind 
the drawer when everything's back in place and that is where he used to keep his little secret store. This was for because of the house being burgled, I presume, was well, it? Well, this was just in case um, um, anybody uh, about the place was light-fingered, but it, it was a really quite a rough area. Good. Well, we move to the other rooms, will we, Mayor? Well, now we've moved into the bedroom, in fact. It's a... Uh, I don't think I'd actually describe it as a four-poster, but it's a bed which has a canopy over it with two posts which are almost level with the base of the pillow. Uh, the rest of it is not covered at all. But it is John Wesley's bed, of course, and it is the room in which he died. That is right, is it? It's half right, if I may say yes, so. Indeed. The actual bed in which he died was um, sold soon afterwards, but this is an exact copy uh, mm. of the one in which he died, and certainly this is the room where he died, and his very last words were an attempt to quote his favourite hymn written by Isaac Watts, who's buried uh, across the road, I'll praise my maker while I've breath. The room itself is exactly the same in uh, its decor and decoration as the room we left before. The pine panelling all around the room, the plain pine panelling, the pine doors, the pine fireplace and so on, and the walls are sort of shady grey. Now, that this is, I suppose, one of the shrines to which Methodists all over the world will come here, to this house and to these rooms in particular. This is quite true. People come from every country, and especially they want to see this room where Wesley died, but even more, the tiny little room which leads off from it. Shall we go in there now and have a look at that, too? Shall we do that? And now, again, same decoration, pale blue here and the sort of well, walls of disturbed by pale blue. Again, the same panelling, the pine panelling round, a pine panelling uh, over the fireplace and a pine-fronted corner cupboard, rather, and shutters also pine. This is primarily the place where he used to say his prayers at four o'clock in the morning. There's an armchair, there's a small table with drawers and uh, a small stool where he used to kneel and here in the um, early morning he both said his prayers and read his Greek Testament and began his thinking for the day who he should um, write to where he should preach and where he should uh, perhaps uh, set out uh, for his journey for the day but this room, more than any other in the whole of these precincts, is the place that moves people deeply when they come here on pilgrimage. I've known people come in here and burst into song or mm -hmm. burst into prayer yes. or burst into tears or burst into silence. But nobody seems to go out of this room quite the same as when they came in. That was John Snag's London. The programme was recorded by Graham Clifford and produced by Roger Clark.